It is a wonderful privilege to be back with you after, I guess, maybe a couple months. And um, I guess the thing that I've always seen here is that there's such a desire to not only get information from God's Word, but really put God's Word into practice. And I think as Doug has led us this morning in the songs and so forth, it's the idea of not just being hearers of the Word, but being doers of the Word and, and experiencing God's Word in our lives. And that's what we want to want to talk about this morning. Um, let's just take a moment now and ask God to open up his word to us, shall we? Our God in heaven, we thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you that your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It pierces and discerns the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. And your word brings life. It brings refreshment. It brings peace. It brings calm in a world of chaos. And we just want to open up our hearts and minds today. We ask that you may give us ears that we can hear, give us minds that we can comprehend, and give us hearts that have that desire just to put into practice what we hear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture lesson is uh, Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to do a little bit of a reverse on you this morning because instead of reading verses 12 through 17, I'd like to read the first 17 verses because I think they really add a lot to what, and we're going to be making reference to that as well. So Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must get rid of the, uh, rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which be, is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Jew, Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And then verses 12 and following, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. There was a young man who requested one last visit with an elderly man who had gone on hospice care. And when he made this request, the family said, well, you're welcome to go and visit him, but you need to realize that he probably is not able to speak anymore. He's unresponsive and sometimes he doesn't even open his eyes. So the young man went to this elderly gentleman who was at the near end of his life, and to his surprise, as he opened the door and walked in the room, there was this faint smile on the man's face. To a greater surprise, he began to hear the man speaking in a soft, quiet whisper. 
the young man spent some time and just expressed his appreciation to this elderly gentleman. This man had been such an important person in his life, his love, his hospitality, his fellowship, his uh, example were so meaningful to this young man that he just wanted some time to just go and express that. And then he asked if he could close and have a word of prayer with him, which he did. When he finished, in a soft, quiet whisper, this elderly gentleman said, you are loved more than what you will ever know. As you think about that, the elderly gentleman was probably saying something like, this visit today just means so much to me. This is like a taste of heaven for me. To be able to have you come here and you are someone whom I treasured in my life and to be able to spend these few moments before I pass from this life into glory, it just means so much. But those words, you are loved more than what you will ever know. Isn't that what God tries to communicate to us each and every single day of our lives? His love, which is so deep, so great, so infinite, so intimate, it goes beyond our wildest imaginations, it surpasses our wildest dreams, it blows beyond our knowledge, our understanding, and our comprehension. Isn't that what God is continually trying to say to you and to me each day? And then the question is, why do we live our lives so often as if we haven't experienced God's love? Something doesn't go our way and we say, I don't know where God is in this whole midst of things. Or where is God in this at all? And in Colossians 3, it begins, it talks about a need for our eternal perspective. And most of the time in life, we are walking around with so many things flooding our life and coming into our life from the news in every single way that it's hard for us to realize what God is saying to us because we're hearing all those other voices and we don't walk with the mindset of an earthly perspective or that spiritual perspective. And Paul begins, set your minds on things above. Set your hearts on on things above. And he's not just saying, go and begin looking at the stars and start gazing up there, but learn to look at everything through an eternal spiritual filter. Elsewhere he says, have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. And so we miss knowing and experiencing God's amazing love because we do not see things and experience things from his eternal perspective. But Paul says there's a second thing that takes place here is that we miss understanding the amazing love of God because we do not clear out the clutter of the old self. And verses 5 through 11 speak about that. And he uses strong words. He doesn't say, hey, you shouldn't do that. He says, put to death. Destroy. Destroy. There's things which are the life of idolatry characterized by a distorted sexuality or evil desires or greed. That uncontrolled anger of, anger of rage and revenge and retaliation. The language of slander and filth speaking to each other with dishonesty and distortion and deception, treating people with partiality, I like you, picking and choosing and so forth. And the words are strong. Put to death. Get rid of these things. Clean out the garbage in your life. And we're never going to comprehend and understand and live in the fullness of God's love until we allow ourselves to have that mind and heart and the beginning to thinking his thoughts and his attitudes after him and failing to clean out the clutter of the old self, letting that old self die more and more and more and the filling and, in, and, and continually trying to receive the new life inside. But I want to go to verse 12 right now and look at three words 
Three words, three ways in which God talks about his infinite love for us. And the words are these. The word chosen, holy, and dearly loved, or intimately loved, or infinitely loved. And I hope we allow each of these words to sink deep, deep, deep into our minds and hearts. That first word, chosen. Think about what it means to be chosen. Or maybe we should think, of, first of all, about what it means not to be chosen, to be left out, to be excluded, to not be invited, to not be included. A child tries out for an athletic team or a play or a musical event or whatever it is and goes to the board where the roster sits there and reads the names and his or her name is not on the list. They didn't make it. They were not included. Or all the children are invited to a special party except one child. He or she has been excluded. Or you're not accepted to a college or university, the one you really wanted to go to. Or you're passed over for a job promotion. Or even getting the job and you're informed that someone else was hired in front of you. And sometimes you think, my qualifications fit for that position so much better but because of nepotism or because of favoritism or because of preferentiality, someone else was included. Or you're asked for input and evaluation in terms of something that you're involved in and you, you work and you think, how could this organization become better? How could we work more together? And how could this be something which would really flourish? And you spend time thinking about it and you give your input and your suggestions and you read the results and it's like everything which you gave was not even read or included in the evaluation or you do not get an opportunity because you come from a poor or relatively uneducated background, or you're not included because they want diversity and there's too many people who are just like you. You know, there's an infinite number of ways that we are left out and excluded all the time. But in the area which it really matters most in life, God says, you are included. You're a chosen person. You've been chosen before the foundations of the world. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you were made alive in Christ. You were chosen. But God demonstrates his very own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of the cross, Christ died for us. Chosen to be included in the family of God. Chosen even though we have nothing to offer or bring to the table. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God did not discard the human race. Instead, he put a plan in place immediately to redeem, to rescue the human race, to bring people into a relationship with himself, into the family of God. And that well-meant offer of salvation goes out to the whole world, to everyone who will come to have true faith in Jesus Christ with a believing heart. And when it, you think about what did it cost for God to choose us? It cost his all. It cost him what tr he treasured the most, what he valued the highest, willing to give up everything by sending his son his one and only son, to die so he could fulfill his commitment to choose us. And someone said, you know, if you were the only person on the face of the earth, God would have done it all just for you or for me to choose us. The second word is holy. And the thing we need to realize is that God is the one who makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy at all. 
We're not talking about a sinless perfection or coming to the point in our Christian life where we no longer sin. We're not talking about that. God is the one who makes us holy. And we ask, how can this be? I mean, I sin every day. I have bad attitudes. I say things I shouldn't say. I'm disobedient. I like Isaiah 6 because it gives us a beautiful understanding of how Isaiah himself went through this. And King Uzziah had died. He had been king for 52 years or sort of a time of prosperity and all the people are sad. And Isaiah goes into the temple and you know the story how the temple is just filled with smoke. Well, the, the smoke in the temple is a sign of the presence of God. And all of a sudden, Isaiah comes to the realization of who he is in front of God. And he says, woe to me. He says, I am ruined. I'm doomed. I'm ready to be destroyed. I am so far from God. But now I stand in his very presence. I will be humiliated. I'll be completely destroyed. I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. And he could also say unclean heart. And I stand around the people who have unclean lips and an unclean heart, and I have seen the Almighty. God Almighty, God's holiness, stood out in his presence, and Isaiah recognized how far he was from God. And a seraph goes and takes a tongue and takes a little clump of coal and touches his lips and says, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You're not just forgiven, but your guilt has been taken away. You know, sometimes you'll ask for forgiveness, but then you'll just feel as guilty as ever and that guilt will continue to plague you. God not only forgives us of our sins, but he removes the guilt. Why? Not because we haven't done something bad, but so that we can live for him in the beauty of what he has in mind for our life. 1 John 1 verse 9, perhaps a verse that every one of us should have down deep in our heart. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To understand God's infinite amazing love, we have to understand his holiness. We have to understand and accept what God has done for us. Your guilt is removed, your sin is atoned for. How does this work? It's simply like this. God comes to you and he comes to me and he takes our sin he takes our iniquity, he takes our transgression, all that crud of our life, and he takes it and he lifts it up, he moves it over, and he places it on Jesus Christ. And then he takes the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus Christ and takes it and moves it over and places it on us. So that when God looks at you, God cannot, cannot stand the sight of sin. But when he looks at you and he looks at me, he looks at us as if we had never committed one sin. Because he looks at us through the perfect righteousness and holiness of Jesus Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism has a, a wonderful question and answer. It's number 60. The question is basically is how are we right with God? And the answer starts, through faith in Jesus Christ, of course. But then it goes on and explains, God grants to me, to us, and credits to us the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if we had never sinned or had ever even been a sinner, as if, we had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for us. So when God looks at you and he looks at me, he doesn't focus on the evil, he doesn't focus on the wrong we have done,
but his eyes are focused on who we are through the faithful satisfaction of Jesus Christ. The third word we have here is that we are dearly loved. How much does God love us? The prophet Jeremiah says, quoting God, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In other words, you go all the way to the very beginning of eternity and God loves us. You go all the way to the future, to the end of eternity, which will never end, and God loves you. And he loves us every single moment in between. I have drawn you with loving kindness, he says. Jesus said it this way in John 15, verse 9. He says, just as the Father has loved me. Think about that. How much has God the Father loved the Son? Infinitely. Incredibly. As the Father loved the Son, nothing more did he treasure, nothing more did he value. Jesus says, as the Father has loved the Son, so I have loved you. In Romans 8, nothing can separate us from God's love. Death, life, angels, demons, past, present, future, powerful influences, condemnation of others, heights, depths, depth, nothing can separate us from God's love. And God demonstrated at the time, he demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were what? Sinners, enemies of the cross, Christ died for us. And in Ephesians 2, it says, God made us alive in Christ when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So how much does God love us? More than what we'll ever know. More than what we'll ever know. And the more we realize this, the more it changes everything in life. We sometimes ask ourselves, why do so many believers, or why do we as believers sometimes we live as though we are like unbelievers, or why do so many believers treat people like, like Christ is not in their lives? Well, Paul says, first of all, because you don't have that eternal spiritual perspective. The second thing is you have not put to death the influences of the old nature. You're not seeking daily to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And so we continue in the influences of the old nature, that sexual impurity, the evil desires, the greed, the uncontrolled anger, the inappropriate language, the deceit and deception, the partiality. But then because we do not understand, we haven't really let it sink down deep how God has demonstrated his love to us by choosing us and what that means and how he has made us holy and how dearly he loves us. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our life and seek the power of the Holy Spirit to change and developing a growing perspective in our life, it changes everything. We talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. The word power which is used is the word dunamis, which is that we get the word dynamite. But it's not the word of blowing things to pieces, it's the word of transforming. It's like taking a dead heart and making it alive. It's taking a, a person who's dead in their sins and making them alive in Jesus Christ. It's taking these influences of the old nature and putting them to death and transforming our lives. And that's why Paul says in verse 12, therefore as God's chosen people who are holy and dearly loved, what do you do? You clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. I would think that every single person in the world is looking for people to treat them with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. We don't necessarily hear all that all the time, do we? But the power of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives as God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved people and changes us. So
so that compassion is there, that kindness is there, that humility is there, and so forth. And as God sees us differently, and we recognize this, we begin to see ourselves differently. And we begin to see others differently as well. And when we begin seeing others differently, he gives us the strength. When people are going through really rough times, instead of running away from them, or when they're going through difficult things in their life or they're living in disobedience, what happens is that we'll continue to bear with those who are struggling. And God will give us that long suffering. Or instead of a demeanor of retaliation, we have a forgiving spirit. Instead of becoming more bitter, we become better. And our hearts are filled with peace, a peace that surpasses understanding. Instead of greed, our lives begin filled with gratitude. And we have that hunger and thirst for God's word to be alive and living in our hearts. And instead of living for self, we want to live for the glory and praise of God. Several years ago in our campus ministry, there was a, a Chinese young lady who came into our ministry. She was, I think, an undergraduate student at that time, and then she wanted to go and work on her master's. And a uh, beautiful gal, kind, loving person. We appreciated her so much. But anyway, one of the things that happened is that the gal who was working with me at that time, the other staff person says, I want to take a number of these Chinese students to a conference between Christmas and New Year. And I said, go ahead. And she did. And this particular student sat there each night, and as she began to hear about how much God loved her and how much God had forgiven her and what Jesus Christ had done for her, her heart began filling up with that desire to want what God wanted. But then she realized that she was treated very poorly and there were some things in her life that she just couldn't forgive. And it's not saying that you go and minimize the, the evil things that people do and that shouldn't be prosecuted and so forth, but these were things in her life that she recognized that were barriers that were keeping her from experience what God wanted her to have. And on the very last night of that conference, with tears just running down her cheeks, she finally just said, God, take it. I want what you have. And God filled her heart with his love and his kindness and transformation. And she became a new believer in Jesus Christ, part of the family of God. I've had times in my life where I've had anger. I've had times in my life where I just really wanted something bad to happen to someone because of what they did. And the more I come to things, and my wife can attest to some times in my life, and one time I walked upstairs and I says, you know what? The fever has just left me. I've given it over to God. God, it's in your hands. It's not in my hands. And what happens is that you have that spirit of forgiveness, and God wants us to have that forgiving spirit. That's part of the whole transformation of rebuilding. And God comes to us this morning and says, I love you so much. I've chosen you. I've made you holy. I love you more than what you'll ever know. Live in the presence of that love and let that change how you live. Let's pray. Father God, sometimes we walk through life and there's so many voices that are out there just continually screaming us at us and we see all the, the tension in relationships and all the harsh things that people are saying that our lives can just be built up in that but it's so good to come into your presence and recognize that you're a God who so intimately and deeply love. You love us, you've loved us from the foundation of the world and how you've chosen us and how you've made us holy 
that is something that's just hard for us to comprehend, that we can stand before you as if we had never committed a sin. And Jesus, to hear those words that you love us as much as the Father loves you. Lord, just take these words, these truths, bring them deep into our hearts and into our minds. Let them become the filter by how we go and treat others. And let our lives be filled with that compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, which comes through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.